Welcome to Live Doff, your online Doff Yomi Shear. Shalom Aleichem and welcome back to today's Daf Hayyemi, Soito Daf Mem Aleph. We are holding on the second line from the top of the Amud. We are discussing the Kohen Gadol, how he does his Kriya Satura on Yom Kippurim when he's finished the main elements of Avodah Hayyem, the main Korbanis. They take out the Sefer Torah, hand it to him, and he reads the parishes which discuss the events of Yom Kippur. He begins from Achrei Mois, the Pasha of Yom Kippurim, in Pasha's Achrei Mois, and moves on to Pasha's Emoir, where he reads the parsha called Ach Be'osur. Says the Gemara, V'koyrei Ach Re'mois. And then he skips over to V'ach Be'osur. Veramini, here comes the question, how could you skip in the Torah? Medalge Be'navi. Only when one is reading Navi, may he skip around from place to place. Ve'eim Medalge Be'torah. But when we read the Torah, we must be careful to read in order. We don't skip around. So how does the Kayin Gadol do so? Omer Abaye. Lekashe. The answer is like this. When do we say that skipping is not allowed? You see, they used to have the Baal Kairi and a Turgaman, a fellow who translated the Torah in Aramaic, so that all understand. So if the, um, the time required to get to the new location, to the new chapter, to the new parak, is long enough that the Turgman would have stopped translating, would have completed his translation, which now necessitates everyone standing there quietly waiting for the uh, resumption of the Kriya. That's Tircha the Tzibur, that's not an expression of covet for the Tzibur, you're not meant to do that. So if it's a long enough break, which requires waiting in silence, that's not allowed. Khan, but here, in our Mishnah, where he's just doing a slight skip, a short distance, skip between Achrei Mois and Pashas Emoir, that's not enough time to allow for silence. Kan Turgaman. Here the Turgaman has not yet finished translating. By the time we're, we found the, you know, the, um, the Psukim of Ach Be'oso, which allows him just to carry on without much of a break. So that's the answer. When do we skip? When it's a short distance skip, which doesn't require waiting as opposed to a longer skip. Asks the Gemara of Allah Katani, but we have a price which explains that Mishnah, their Medalgim and Navi, only when one is reading Navi can he skip, and Medalgim and Torah, but we never skip. Vat Kama Medalgim, and even when we're allowed to skip, when we read the Navi, how much of a skip at Kadesh Aliyah? It's got Turgim and only the amount of time which does not allow for a break for silence. And that's only by Navi. So, by Navi we can skip, provided we address the Kavarat Zibur element. A short skip. Apparently, if you read in the Torah, you have to be extra careful not even to do any skipping. Torah requires focus. There is uh, actual mitzvahs and details of halachis. We don't skip around. We lose our train of thought. So how does the kind God do so on your Kippur? Elam Rabbi, he says, Rabbi, okay, I'll tell you the pshat. Look, Asha, the answer is like this. Come be Indian echad. If it's in the same topic, then we can skip. Because uh, it allows us to maintain our train of thought and our focus. Kan yana. When we say no skipping by Torah, that's when it's from one topic to the other. And that creates a distraction, a diversion. Hard to focus and concentrate, and you lose that train of thought and you lack proper clarity. But even that, but that is Dafka in Torah. By Torah, which Rashi says contains mitzvahs and all kinds of azhores, there we have to be careful to stay focused. So, you can skip. But even that is only allowed as long as you're not encroaching on the covet of Tzibar. It's not a long enough break to necessitate standing in silence. So we have to address two separate things here, right? There's the covered at Tzibur element. And that is addressed by making it only a short skip. And then, even if it's a short skip and you've addressed covered at Tzibur, the topic at hand has to be clear, without confusion, without distraction. You have to maintain the same topic, in fact, we have a riot from a brisa to this 
approach. Medalgin b'Torah b'ni nechad. When you're reading the Torah, you can skip if it's in the same topic, which maintains focus and concentration. Uben Navi. If you read Navi, which doesn't necessarily require so much focus and concentration, Mishnei and Yonim, even if you're going from one topic to the other, it's okay. So now you've addressed the focus and concentration aspect. What about the Kavarat Sibor element? Oh, Vikan, Vikan. Bechdei shelo yifsei katurgamon. And whether you're uh, skipping in the Torah, whether you're skipping in the in the Navi, right? The heter of skipping is only if it does not encroach on covered at Zibur, if it's short enough that the Turgman is still, you know, going on with his translation and uh, does not require standing in silence. Continues the Ibrahisa, but even when reading Navi, there are some restrictions restrictions in terms of skipping around. Being with Dalgan mi Navi Navi, you can't skip from one safer Navi to the other. That's too much of a skip. Too much of a diversion. But Trey Asar, which is the uh, the compilation of the twelve small, you know, svarim, so it's sort of all joined together, is considered one and the same unit. Then we can skip even from one uh, safer to the other within that uh, Trey Asar arrangement. It's considered sort of one unit. And even when we do skip, we don't want to skip from the end back to the beginning, sort of out of order, right? So you can't skip from the end of the sefer to the beginning because that uh, confuses people and that's going a bit too far. So bottom line is like this. When are we middalgan? When are we allowed to skip? So first of all, uh, the first basic condition is kaverat zibur. Shalayifsekaturgman. We don't allow for a long enough skip which requires standing in silence. As long as it can be sort of done within the time frame of the Turgumon translation, you're okay on that. Now, having addressed that, what about focus and concentration? So when it comes to Torah, it's only allowed if it's the same topic, Inyan Echad. Otherwise, not allowed. By Novi, even Shnei Yanam, but not from one Sefer to the other. By Tari Asa, you can even do it from one Sefer to the other. Continues the Gemara. Uba Asa, Shebuchom HaShapkudim, Kori so he read Achrimais, he read Ba'achba Asr. When he gets to the third part of his reading, Ba'asr, Achoydesh Ashvi, which is in Chumash Abkudim, in Sefer Bar Midbar, in Pashas Pinchas, that he does by heart. Why? Why doesn't he just roll the Sefer to Pashas Pinchas and read inside? Amar of Hunabar Yehuda, Rav Sheshes. It's not covered at Sibur, to have them wait. We don't. Roll the Sefer Torah in Sibur in public, which would require them to stand and wait. Asks the Gemara, okay, but still, we have another solution. Bring another Sefer Torah, which, is, which has been rolled to that location, which is can be open to Parshas Pinchas and read straight from there, instead of reading by heart. We have two Turuts. Rav Hunabar Yudah Amar Mishim Pagome Shal Rishin. We don't want to introduce a new Sefer Torah to the scene because it would perhaps negate, it would appear like it's negating the authority of the first, the authority and kashras of the first Sefer Torah. It would appear like we just discovered a problem in the kashras of the first Sefer Torah. Therefore, we never uh, introduce another Sefer Torah. The reason is because when you bring another Sefer, you have to bring a, uh, make a new bracha. Which is an unnecessary brach. We don't want to do that. And therefore, we don't bring a new Sefer Asks the Gemara on the first shot of a Pagam. Are we concerned uh, about negating the kashras of the first Sefer by bringing another Sefer into the scene? What happens if? Rosh Chodesh Tevis, which happens to be Hanukkah, falls out on a Shabbos. Maybe Shtolosh Tevis. We bring three separate separate Sefer Torah. The Koran he reads. Achas Minyan Shalyim. From one he reads the actual, you know, chapter of that week, Kriyas HaTorah. The Achas Shol Rosh Chodesh. One, the Pasha of Rosh Chodesh. The Achas Shol Rosh Chodesh. The third, he reads about Hanukkah. Three Sefer Torah. Not a problem. Answer is, plus a Gavri, 
when we have three separate people giving, getting three separate aliyahs, but loss of sifri, in three sifri Torah. So perhaps, you know, each person prefers his sefer Torah. It's not an apparent, obvious negation of any sefer Torah there. Like a pagam, there's no pagam. But in our case, where it's chad gavar, one person reading betray sifri from two sefer Torah, going from one to the other, that raises a question mark. Ika pagama, there's a chash of gam, and we try to avoid that. When he's finished reading, he concludes with eight brachas. The brachas turn around, and the brachas will explain them to us. He does the brachas at Torah. The way we do when we finish the aliyah in the Beis HaKnesses. That's number one. Next brachas, that's Ritzay. That's Moedim. That's the bracha pertaining to Mechilas Avoynas, which we say during Shemone Esrei of Yom HaKippurim. That's the middle bracha of our Shemone Esrei. Allah Migdash Bifnei Atzme, another bracha special tefillah for the Migdash, for the Kehanim Bifnei Atzme, another one pertaining to the Kehanim. Al Yisrael Bifnei Atzme, he makes a tefillah to Davin Akal Yisrael. Val Yishlaim Bifnei Atzme, one separate one for Yerushalayim. Ushara Tefillah, and then he goes to speak about other things. Vashara Tefillah, what is that? Torah Boran. Hashara Tefillah, mentioned in the Mishnah. That's a Tefillah, a Tchino, a Rina, Ubakasha. Sorry, that's a Tchino, Rina, Ubakasha. A beseechment. Um, a song, so to speak. A, a request. Different forms and variations of davening. And he uses all those forms to tell Hashem, Sha'am Chayisro, Tzvichon Lebashe'a, look, Klai Yisro needs a salvation. Or Yeshua, V'chayisim, and he concludes with the bracha of Baruch Ata Hashem, Shemeya Tefillah. Okay, so he's uh, finished reading, he's finished his brochis, Mekan Ve'eloch, going forward, what happens? Kol Echad Ve'echad, everybody in attendance, maybe a Sefer Torah, Metech he brings his own personal Sefer Torah, which he had at home, V'koyer boy, and he comes to the uh, shul in the Beis HaMiklash, and reads from the Sefer Torah, V'kol Ka'achlama, what's the point of this whole ceremony? Kedilahara is to express, to show Chazusay, the beauty of his personal Sefer Torah, which he invested in, Chazusay L'Rabim, to show it in public, to show how dear Hashem's, Mitzvah and Sefer Torah is to us This is very appropriate a show of expression of love to Hashem on Yom Kippurim. Continues the Mishnah. Pashas HaMelech Ketzah. So back in the beginning of the parak, we spoke about things which require Lashon HaKodesh only, one of which is Pashas HaMelech. What is that? That's the Hakhel ceremony which takes place once in seven years. The year after Shemitah, we call it the eighth year. So it takes place the Motsoy Yontev of the first day of Sukkot, following Shemitah. It takes place in the Bisa Midosh. They would erect this huge, this, this uh, bomber, this uh, you know, stage upon which the Melech would stand and read from the Psukim to inspire and direct Klal Yisrael in the right direction. Parsha Samalach Ketzad has, how does this come about? How does it happen? Motsoy Yontev Arishan Shalchag. So this is the night following the first day of Yom Tov, Sukkot, B'Shmini, eighth year, meaning the year after seventh year, which is Shmita, B'Moytzoy Shviz, right? Oysen Loi Bima Shaleitz, B'Azorah, they erect for him a wooden stage in the Azorah, Vu Yeshiv upon which the king sits, and reads the Sefer Torah, Shenemar, as the Pasuk says, Mekeitz Sheva Shana B'Moyed, at the end of the seven years, on Yom Tov, he gets up and he inspires Klal Yisrael, tells him all about the important parts of the Torah. Chazan Aknesses, everything is important, but you know the crucial parts which um, we, we, uh, we uh, have the king uh, select to inspire Kal Yisrael. Chazan Aknesses, so how does this happen? The Chazan Aknesses, which is the fellow who sort of administers the, uh, the, um, the Bes Aknesses, which was in the uh, Bes HaMikdash, Noito Sevetur, he takes the Sevetur, for Noisno Loresh Aknesses passes it on to the Gabai who sort of runs these spiritual matters of the shul. Varesh HaKnesses, that fellow, Noisn and Askan, hands it over to the vice assistant Kohen Godel of Askan, Noisn and Kohen Godel, who passes it on to the Kohen Godel. We're not there. We're not there yet. The Kohen Godel, Noisn and Lamelech, passes it on to the king, Va Melech, Oymed the Makabal, the Melech, accepts the Sefer Torah standing up. The Kohen, and he reads it for all to hear. How does he read it? The Kohen, Yoshev, he reads it sitting down. Agrippas HaMelech. So Agrippas was a, a fellow, a descendant of Hordus. Hordus was actually um, ever a slave in the um, Hashmonoi family. He took over the 
kingdom and eventually Agrippas inherited the, 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 inherited the Malchus. Now, as we're going to learn soon, he wasn't really suitable for his position. There's Machlikis Rashi and Tesis. Tesis learned that uh, he wasn't suitable at all, Torah because even if his mother was Jewish, but the father, his father hailed from Avodim, so he's not Roy. Rashi seems to learn that he was really suitable because his mother was Jewish, but still it wasn't appropriate for him to be the, the leader because he descends from Avodim. In any case, Agrippa Samalach, this person, Omad Vekibel Vekara Emid. Not only did he take the Sefer Torah standing up, but he actually remained in a standing position as a show of respect while he read from the Torah of Shibchu Chachamim. Chacham praised him for that. But as he's reading along and he gets to the Parshas HaMelech, we call it the Parshas HaMelech because it describes how uh, we appoint a king and what qualifications are required. And he started reading that a king must be a non-foreigner. He must be a, a full-fledged Yisrael on, you know, on all sides. And he didn't really fit the bill. Zolgu Ein of Demois. He's starting to cry. Omer Loi Chacham told him, Don't worry. Achinu Ata, Achinu Ata, you are our brother. You're okay. And the Gemara says that actually it was inappropriate. They were flattering him out of, you know, uh, fear. And on account of that, they suffered. We're going to see in the Gemara. So now, typically a king gets up, and what does he read? He reads from the beginning of Sefer Dvarim, Eilah Dvarim, Ad Shema, until he gets to Shema, he reads Shema, Hushma, Vayim Shemoya, right? Asa Ta Asa, which discusses giving a Maser, and Stoka, Kisachal Allah Aser, once again, uh, speaking about giving Maser and the various, you know, crop obligations, Upasha Samelech, then he gets to the portion which describes the qualifications of a melech, or brachos of klolis, he goes to brachos of hargrizim and har evil, until he finishes that parsha, which happens to be parsha's kisavay, which discusses the uh, brachos and klolis and uh, the toichacha, all the negative things which result from negative behavior. Okay, he's done his uh, kriyas atayra, and he concludes with those brachos, which the king Gadol says, but there's one difference, because actually this is taking place on Sukkot, not on Yom Kippur. So, Brachas, the Kohen Gadol, Mavarach Oisin, those are the same Brachas, said by the Kohen Gadol on Yom Kippur, HaMelech, Mavarach Oisin, the king likewise mentions those Brachas, Ela Shanoisin, Vral Regolim, but he substitutes a Bracha for the Regolim, Atah Bachar Tonu, Tachas Mechilas Avin, in place of the Mechilas Avin Bracha, which is unique to Yom Kippur. Now, the mission started that the king gets up on Motzai Yom Tevarishin, Shalchag, and we have the word Bashmini. Asks the Gemara Bashmini, meaning on the eighth day of Sukkot, Sakadaita, how could you say that? You just told me it's, it's a Motzai Yom Tevarishin, not on the eighth day of Sukkot, Ema Bishminis. We switch it and we modify it. It didn't mean the eighth, uh, the eighth day of Sukkot, rather Bishminis, the eighth year of the uh, you know seven year cycle, so it's a year after Shemitah. Now the Pasuk in describing the exact uh, date of when this takes place uses the following uh, descriptions. Miket Sheva Shana, at the end of the seven year cycle, that's number one. Number two, B'moyed, during the uh, Yom Tov of Shnas HaShemitah, B'chag HaSukas, and then B'voy Kol Yisrael Leroyz, when Kol Yisrael comes to show themselves and to express their you know, closeness to Hashem. Why does the Pasuk have to go through all these different, you know, elements of uh, identification in order to give us the exact date? So we're going to go through them one by one and see why they're necessary. Why does the Torah have to go through all those, um, you know, details in describing the date? Tzrichi, all are needed. The Torah would only say, you know, at the end of seven years, I would say, okay, start counting today. As soon as you enter Israel, even before they actually began counting Shemitah, which happened way later, uh, 14 years later. So I would think start from now. Have I mean a nimnu mahash to restart the seven year count from today? Today is one, next year is two. But I've got to be Shemitah, even though the seventh year is not going to be Shemitah, because there were no Shemitahs at this point in history. That's why the Torah adds the words, B'moyed Shnasa Shemitah. It must be when Shemitah is being observed. Because Rahman is Shemitah, the Parasuk would only say that it's after seven years on Shemitah, without saying the word B'moyed, Havamina B'sev Shemitah, I would say, oh, okay, it's at the, uh, the end of Shemitah, end of the Shemitah year. Because Rahman B'moyed, that's what the Pasuk adds the word B'moyed, no, it takes place on a Yom Tov. 
Because of a moed, if it only who has a moed, I would say, I'm Rosh Shata. Which Yom Tov? Rosh Hashanah. So, you know, at the end of Shemitah, as we hit Rosh Hashanah, on Rosh Hashanah of the eighth year, that's when we do Hakel. Because Rachman and Chag that's why the Torah adds the word Chag HaSukkos. It's not on Rosh Hashanah, it's on Sukkos. Because Rachman and Chag HaSukkos, if we would only say Chag HaSukkos, I would say, I mean, I feel Yom Tov and even the last day of Sukkos. On the eighth day of Sukkos. Because Rachman and Bevoi Kol Yisrael, the Pasuk adds the words Bevoi Kol Yisrael, which means Ma'aschal Tadamoyed, when Kol Yisrael comes to visit the Beis Amigdash, the beginning, the first portion of Sukkos, and as Rashi explains, it can't take place on Sukkos itself because they can't build the uh, stage and they can't have it sitting there a whole Yom Tov. It's going to crowd things, so inevitably it has to take place the night following the first day of Sukkot. So the Sevater is handed from person to person until it gets to the Melech. V'chazen HaKnesses. Noita Sevater. V'noyis Nurish HaKnesses. Until it gets up to the Melech, which would appear, it would appear like we're giving Kavod to the lower tier, remember, to the Chazen, to the Shamas, to the Skan. We're according them honor. And that's an interesting point. Shamas Mino, we could perhaps deduce from here that Chol can cover the Talmud, we do give cover to even a, a lower level person in the presence of the greater person, because otherwise, why would we go through this whole chain until we get to the Melech? Omar Abaye, no, perhaps here it's different. Here it's in the presence of the more prominent individual, the king, and it's all sort of a show of respect of him. Look how far, look how long it ta- takes to get to him. And one secretary, and another one, another one. Kula, the whole procedure of Mishum Kvoide the Melech is an expression of Kavid. It's an ultimate expression for the Melech. The Melech Oimed Umekabel Vekura Yish. A group as a Melech, Omad Vekibel Vekura Oimed. Says the Gemara. So the fact that the Mishnah tells us that a king would accept the Sefer standing up, in a standing position, Oimed Mechal the Yish would sound like he was sitting until then. He gets up to receive the Sefer Torah. Vamamar, haven't we learned? Sitting is not to be done in the Azorah. Ein Yeshiva Ba'azorah, Elo Lamalchev is David Bivad. Only a king from David Amal's family sits in the Azorah. But, otherwise we don't sit in the Azorah. So, you know, a Melech, who is not from Zerah David, we have the Malchi Yisrael, not part of David Amal's family, how could they sit in the Azorah? Especially not the, his fellow Agrippas. Answers the Gemara, Good Amr of Chizda, just like Rav Chizda told us yesterday, Bezos Nashim, that the Kain Gadol reading Bezos Nashim, where sitting was allowed, Hachanam here as well, Bezos Nashim, it took place in Bezos Nashim, where sitting was allowed. Vishibchu Chachamim, so Agripas was Machmer, he read the Torah while he was standing, Chachamim praised him. Shibchu, Maklal the Shaper Ava, the fact that they praised him indicates that he did okay. He was commendable for his, he was commended for his actions. Why? He's negating the honor of of royalty. A king is not meant to lower himself. Omar of Ashir, Rashi tells us, Afilu al-Mandu Omar, Nasi, that the head of the uh, Sanhedrin, Shemach al-Kvaydeh, who um, was easy on his covet, it was, uh, you know, Moichel on his covet, Kvaydeh Moichel, that works. That's only by a Nasi. Whose covet is based on his Torah knowledge and that he's allowed to be moichel on it. But a melech, melech shemachel al kvoida, melech cannot be moichel on his covet. Ain't kvoida machel, it doesn't work. He can't, you know, willingly relinquish his honor. Shenamar, it's not his business. It's Hashem's malchus. He's representing Hashem's kingdom. Shenamar, same tasem alacha melech. The extra word, same tasem, place, place, tells us, hey, he's meant to be placed properly in a proper position of, of authority which doesn't allow for compromise. So how could a, a king like Agrippas decide to override that? Mitzvah Shani, here it's different. It wasn't for personal benefit. It was an expression of Kavar HaTayra, that's allowed. That, that doesn't really undermine his, his personal Kavar, the Kavar of the Malchus, because it's for spiritual matters. Quite the contrary. He rises in regard and respect uh, by giving covet to the Torah. Now, everybody asks on the Gemara, what do you mean? Uh, we're speaking about Agrippas. Why is the Gemara bothered with Agrippas going the extra mile for covet Torah? He wasn't really a legal king to begin with. Uh, so, 
a Teisvis, who was actually in Masechus Ksubas Dav Zayin, explained by Rabbi Hanan Rasim and Kovitz Aris explains that true, he wasn't technically a legal king, but the fact is he was running the show. The fact is they did accept him as a king, proper or not, but he was the de facto king, and in that position he is um, inevitably re- representing Hashem's Malchus, and therefore this concept would apply to him as well. The Gemara answers, well, it's a mitzvah matter, and therefore it's different. So he's reading along, and when he gets to the Parsha Samalach, which sort of shoots him in the foot, he started crying. He broke down, and they comforted him. At that very moment, when they flattered him, the enemies of Israel, this is a euphemism, they call Israel, the ones that were involved, they were guilty of clay of being destroyed, because they flattered him. Which is a no-no. Amar Rab Shimon ben Chalaf to Miyim Shigabra Agreifa Shel Chanufa. From the time where Chanufa flattery became strong and prominent, the agreif, the fist, sort of the power of flattery, got stronger and stronger and became more pervasive and pre- prevalent. This Afsu Hadayana, the uh, judges and courts, perverted their ways. Rashi explains because uh, the Dayanim had just one thing in mind: their own personal interests, and proceeded to do their judgment based on these ulterior motives. And people started committing grave errors. Why? Rashi says because the, the prominent people, the community leaders, would just flatter the Rishayim and nobody would get in anybody's way. And as a result, nobody has a right to boast and tell his friend, look, I'm greater than you, I'm higher than you, because even if it's true, but the fact is you're not giving him Musar. You're not setting people straight. You're not correcting people's actions. So you're co-responsible for anybody's bad deeds. There's one exception to this rule. Typically, we don't flatter. But when we're threatened by the Rishoyim, such as in Olam Hazel, when the Rishoyim run the show, we're allowed to do that. We're allowed to flatter, to protect ourselves. In this world, Shinemar, we have the Pasuk describing what's going to happen in the future when Mashiach comes and everything is corrected. And everything is set straight and transparent. A novel, a lowly man, will no longer be given the title Nadev, oh, a man of prominence. Ulekili, a person who's drawn after wine. He's not going to be considered somebody chashiv, like in this world. Then everybody sees exactly for what it is. Mechlal, apparently, now in this, day, in this day and age, surely it's allowed to protect yourself. Reb Shimon Lakish Omar, I have a raya. From the Pasuk in the Torah of Mehocha, I can show you this idea. When Yaakov Avinu met Esau, he says, look, wow, greeting you is like greeting Hashem, like greeting a Malach. I want you to take my gift because it's an honor for me. It's like meeting a Malach. Why is he flattering him? Oh, he's trying to scare him off. He's trying to intimidate him. No, actually, that's the next Gemara. Roshim Malakish learns that um, he was just flattering him to protect himself, saying a good word, praising him. You're like, uh, you're like me greeting a Malach. So we see the Chanufa is allowed in this world. Upligad Rabbi Levi. Oh, but this is a different approach than Rabbi Levi's approach, who had a different understanding of why Yaakov Avinu expressed himself in this way. It was actually meant to scare off Esav. It wasn't meant to flatter him. The <laughs> Amr Levi. This whole encounter, this whole discussion between Yaakov and Esav, what does it compare to? So Reuven invites Shimon over to his house. And Shimon notices that he's under threat. Reuven's motive is to kill Shimon. Armor he does a quick one. He says, Look, this food that you're serving me, this food that you're serving me, you know what it tastes like? It's exactly like the dish that I had back in the king's place. <laughs> there was a subtle message there. Omar Sarubin backs off and he says, Yodale Malka? The king is friendly with him? The king knows him? Okay, Mr. Fis, that uh, uh, makes him, uh, grips him with fear of a Leikotale and he holds back from killing him. Like, same thing with Yaakov. He was under threat of Esav. So he tells Esav, uh, my dear brother, you know, greeting you, it reminds me of, you know what, like when I met that Malach there, and you know, 
Uh, Esav's uh, starting to think twice before he, uh, he interferes with Yaakov and tries to hurt him. So it wasn't flattery at all. It was actually meant as a tool to threaten Esav. Omer Belezer, kol Adam sheish bechanufa, a person who conducts himself with flattery, maybe aflo elam, he brings down anger into the world, Hashem's anger, shenemar, v'chan feileiv, yosimu af, those who engage in flattery, they um, generate Hashem's anger, chas v'shom, v'loyed, not only that, Allah, a person who engages in this behavior, even when he's going through a hard time and he dives to Hashem, it doesn't work. When I don't use do you serve, I bring hardships on these people, even when they daven. Don't bother, I'm not going to listen. A person who's involved in flattery, even the unborn children should make even in their mother's stomach, they curse him. A person addresses a Russia by saying, Sadakata, you're righteous fellow. Hoping to get some sort of benefit from this person, Yikvu Amim Yizumu Leumim, even the Amim curse him and Leumim as well. Vein Koiv, when it says Yikvu Koiv is Ela Klola, Lashon of cursing. Shnam Aloy Kaboy, Kale, we find that by Bilam, Kaboy is curse. Who's going to curse them? The Leumim. Who are those Leumim? Unborn children. Vein Leumim, Lu Baran Shanemar, Uloim Aloy Mamats, we have this by Rivka, the word Leumim describing unborn children. Vulnerable answer. Kol Adam Sheish Bechanufa, person who's involved in flattery, Nefil Gehenam. Ultimately, ends up in Gehenna. Shnamar hoy, whoa, ha'imrim l'ratoi for those who dress bad as good. Lo toiv ra, they consider toy. They consider ra to be toiv. Maxiv achor, what's the consequence? Lo chen kachol kash lashen ish, just like fire consumes hay. V'chashash lo hava yirpe, and that's uh, describing uh, this fellow who's um, who was engaged in flattery to the rishayim. He will end up. Um, being affected by them, he ends up in Gehenna. So, uh, why is he so responsible? Because the fact is, um, you're supposed to set them straight. You're not meant to justify their actions and flatter them. Okay. We learned about the brachas of Kohen Gadol. We learned about the brachas of the Melech. We learned about the Kriyas of the Kohen Gadol. When, and when you're not meant to skip. We learned about the story of Agrippas and that they should not have flattered him. We learned about the Melech that's typically not going to be Meichel HaKvodoi. But if it's the shame mitzvah, that's allowed. All the best to you and Atzlacha Rabbah.